دوستان ما okay. so, thank you to the organizers for uh, laying on this uh, excellent uh, meeting and thanks also to my my collaborators here uh, many of whom are um, uh, past and, and present members of the of the deep group that we have at at Liverpool. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about geomagnetic variations on the very longest of time scales, so tens of millions of years and, uh, and longer. And for that, we need, we need paleomagnetism. And paleomagnetism uh, was uh, a theoretical foundation um, was um, done by Louis Neal in uh, uh, the 1950s. Uh, so he showed how it was possible that igneous rocks, as they cool down, could acquire a thermo remnants uh, that will be stable then throughout geological history. So what we're showing up here is the relaxation time tau. Um, and then we have that uh, yeah, bunch of magnetic properties of the, of the individual single domain grain um, in the, on the right-hand side of this equation, but also an exponential dependence on temperature. And uh, how that one computes is that if you're up near the um, Curie temperature of, of magnetite here, which is 580 degrees Celsius. So as a rock is cooling down, its magnetic particles pass through their, their, um, uh, their Curie temperature. Um, the relaxation time, the time for, for the magnetization to relax to 1 over E, is just a few seconds to start with. So the net magnetization of, of, the, uh, of the rock can then align itself um, with, the, with the ambient field. But then you drop down just... Uh, a few tens of degrees further down, and already this relaxation time has extended beyond the age of the universe. Uh, so extremely stable um, thermo remnants. And uh, over here, what I'm showing is uh, a micrograph uh, of a, um, it's a 550 million year old uh, basalt from Newfoundland. And the um, uh, overlay on top of this is magnetic uh, flux map. This is measured with a quantum diamond microscope in um, uh, Harvard. And uh, you can see lots of patches of uh, nice little dipoles uh, in there, many of them associated with grains uh, that are too small even to be imaged by this uh, scanning electron microscope. Uh, so really just to get across the point that magnetic grains are ubiquitous uh, in nature. OK, so I, I was uh, warned that I might get thrown out of the institute for showing uh, fieldwork photos, but I wanted to, uh, <laughs> to put them in anyway. Um, just to get a point, uh, get across the point really that paleomagnetism is, is limited by the, um, uh, the geological record. Uh, fortunately, the Earth is big and it has rocks of, of, of many different ages, but we do have to travel around the world to, to get to these, uh, to the rocks that are the right uh, age with the right properties to solve the, the problem that we're, uh, we're trying to address. And uh, once we've found them, then we like to, to drill them uh, in situ, uh, orient them, because then we can orient them easily and then we ship them back home, we chop them up, and then we perform a whole series of rock magnetic and paleomagnetic experiments uh, in the laboratory. And <coughs> our end goal uh, is to have the full vector of the magnetic field at the time and the place that the rock acquired its remnants. And what we're mostly talking about here is, is igneous rock, so that's the, the time and the place that the rock cooled down from, from uh, uh, a molten state, the primary remnants. OK, so with paleomagnetism, we can um, uh, address a whole series of questions about you know, the long time scale variations of the geomagnetic field and the geodynamo. Uh, so these are the questions that I'm going to uh, tackle in, in this talk. So we'll be asking for, for how long, uh, how much of Earth's history have we had a, uh, a dynamo? And uh, you know, today's field is clearly dominated by an axial dipole. Um, but can we, can we say anything about the paleo field going back into, into to deep time? And if we depart from that state, you know, what do those, what do those departures uh, look like? When did they, what did they happen? And then finally, we'll get to, to inferences. So um, <coughs> I caught Bruce's talk uh, online when he's um, saying about you know, how important it is to study magnetic uh, climate and not just weather. Well, here we're really talking about climate change, I guess, and these time scales. OK, so a shout out for the Pint um, database, Paleo Intensity database that we, we maintain um, at Liverpool. We, we just did a, the whole Liverpool group was involved in a, a major update of this uh, database and, and uh, carefully screening um, all the, the, the data that went in. So 
That produced uh, two papers, both lead authored by um, uh, Richard um, Bono, who's, who's now at uh, Florida State University. And um, uh, the second one of these, so the first one was just describing the, the new database. Here we, we're showing three different plots. It's just increasing severity of, of criteria uh, that we're applying. So, so the data that are left here are, are more reliable and trustworthy than, than, in, the, than in the top plot. Um, and then, yeah, the second one of these papers was uh, um, introducing this MCADAM model. So that's Monte Carlo axial dipole average um, model, um, uh, which you know was used to generate these uncertainties on the, the evolution um, uh, through the uh, through the whole time period for the last you know uh, back to 4.2 billion years. So that's I guess what I'm getting at here is that we do have estimates of the dipole moment back in the in the Hadean. So you know beyond 4.2. Uh, billion years, but these are mired in controversy, I have to say, and so a lot of them, uh, the older ones, just drop out at the first um, uh, pass of, of selection uh, criteria. But we're still left with some back in the Paleoarchean, 3.5 um, uh, billion years ago. And I want to provide you with actually, sorry, um, with what I consider to be some of the strongest evidence actually that the field that the dynamo was up and running and producing a field not dissimilar. Uh, wholly dissimilar to, to today, um, yeah, 3.5 uh, billion years. So more field photos, but this is, um, so what this is, is you can see the little small uh, boulders and, and, and pebbles of, this is volcanic material that has been incorporated, presumably through some dramatic flood event, um, into a conglomerate um, uh, bed. Okay, so these have been sampled, sometimes more than one specimen per class or, or uh, pebble, if you like. Now, these results, these directional results, looked very reliable, looked very, very stable, and within individual um, class, we were getting indistinguishable directions. So that all looks great, but then between the class, we were getting completely random directions on a sphere. And the only simple explanation for this is that these volcanic samples acquired their magnetization um, uh, when they originally cooled down or, or sometime shortly afterwards, and then retained that uh, during the flood and deposition event and then have held on to them all time uh, since. So this is a, what we call a positive uh, conglomerate test. Now this conglomerate was capped by a tough unit. So here think of a kind of an ash cloud from a volcano that then has rained out and settled into a thick uh, ash layer. Uh, now, this was good for two reasons. First thing, it contained zircons, and these zircons um, uh, are datable using uranium lead techniques, so it gave us a very um, uh, precise uh, minimum age for this conglomerate, okay? 3.455 billion uh, years. And better still, then we got this directions from this uh, tough unit, and uh, we had other directions from, from older uh, lavas. Uh, they plotted up here to the, to the northeast, and shallow, and we got this kind of southwest one uh, down here. So this is nearly antipodal, very tentative uh, evidence uh, for the field actually uh, undergoing reversals uh, back uh, three and a half uh, billion years ago. For really strong evidence of, of a reversing field, you have to go somewhat younger in the, in the geological record, but 2.7 billion years, I'd say there's some strong evidence uh, for reversals. Okay, so the field was up and running, and it seems to have been running for, for, for most of Earth history. Um, so now we can ask the question, well, what about, the, um, what about its stability? What about its shape? So the tool we're going to use for this is um, VGP dispersion, so virtual geomagnetic poles. Uh, Monica um, outlined earlier in the week. Um, so it's essentially the, um, the geomagnetic pole that would fit the direction you measure under a purely dipole dipolar field, okay? And the field is not purely dipolar, so today we don't, uh, our VGPs will vary depending on where on Earth you, uh, you measure them. And this map up here is showing the deviation from the, um, from the geographic pole that you have depending on where you, you measure your, um, uh, your VGP. And what you can see is, is things are much better in the, in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. And in particular, you have this kind of bullseye at low latitudes in the southern hemisphere. This is associated with the, um, the, the South Atlantic anomaly, um, where we've got a deviation of the, of the geomagnetic pole of you know, uh, more than 30 degrees from the, from the geographic pole. 
Um, now, we wanted to test the hypothesis that um, this region of Earth was uh, kind of a locus for recurring anomalies. Um, so that's been put forward um, based on the argument that lower mantle, um, unusual conditions in the lower mantle are, are affecting, um, uh, affecting the directions there. So um, St. Helena is right uh, slap bang in the middle of this bullseye and uh, contains lava flows that were up to around 10 million years ago, between 8 and 11 uh, million years ago. So we sampled a bunch of these. This is, each one of these is directions. Um, you see some are south and down, some are north and up. These are the normal polarity, these are the reversal polarity, and then we've got some samples, some um, that were magnetized during a reversal uh, transition. Um, convert these into, um, into VGPs, and you get a nice cloud, and it's centered not quite on the geographic pole, but, but not too far away. And this is a present day pole, which is very aberrant on the, you know, in today's field, but you can see that in terms of these lava flows that formed between 8 and 11 million years ago, it's not actually that unusual. There were others that were further away from the geographic pole um, uh, than these ones. Um, so our conclusion was that it supported the idea that there is recurrent behavior on the million year, uh, recurrent anomalous behavior on the million year time scale in this, in this region. Okay, but um, the other reason I'm showing you this is, is uh, to explain VGP dispersion, which is this tool we're gonna use. So that's based on the uh, the breadth of this, this cloud of VGP. It's just the angular standard deviation of that cloud. Um, I apologize that this slide is, is very busy, um, but just for now, focus on this, this one panel. So this is VGP dispersion against latitude, um, volcanic rocks of all ages from uh, the last uh, 10 million years. And what you can see is that the uh, uh, VGP dispersion increases as you move away from, from the equator. Um, it can be fit by a very simple uh, quadratic model, uh, which we call model G. Uh, so two parameters, A defines the um, VGP dispersion at the equator, and B de defines its latitudinal uh, dependence. Okay, so above this, we've got for the Earth, we're looking at the shape of the magnetic field as defined by AD over NAD, the, axial, the power in the axial dipole divided by power in everything else. So we've got a time series here just for the last 100,000 years from, uh, <coughs> from GGF um, 100K, and uh, that comes out a median value of 20, which is not so dissimilar from that which we see uh, from the average of, say, uh, GoFEM or from IGRF, which is, uh, which is uh, shown here. Now, what we've got over here are three, uh, the same information, but for three different dynamo simulations. Now, the details of these dynamo simulations are not particularly um, important, but they cover a range of stability and, and dipolarity. Okay, so the left here we've got um, extreme multipolar behavior, very time variable, um, lots of excursions and reversals, and that's reflected in a very noisy um, uh, VGP dispersion curve. And then track through over to here, we've got something that is very uh, geocentric axial dipole-like, GAD-like, um, and um, with a high AD over NAD um, and very low uh, VGP dispersion. And when we uh, did an analysis of um, uh, 61 dynamo simulations with a range of parameters, and we, we looked at how um, two things varied, this AD over NAD uh, median, and then this model GA parameter, just the, the VGP dispersion at the equator, and we obtained this nice power law. And then, um, so these, I can show you, these are the models um, shown here, and we've got these green points. These are various geomagnetic and paleomagnetic uh, field models also sitting on this power law. And I, I got very excited when I saw this because uh, generally speaking, you've got to get AD over NAD, an estimate of that, then you, know, you need a global field model for which you know, if we've only built for the last 100,000 years and you know, can't imagine building them back millions, many millions of years ago. Um, whereas model GA, we can obtain from compilations like this going back billions of years. So we have a, a, a way to estimate the, the, the dipolarity of the field um, from PSV data. So what then do we see? Uh, so we're looking on very, very long time scales here. So we've averaged um, uh, VGP dispersion uh, from igneous rocks of, of all ages back to 2.9 uh, billion years, but split it into three different components. So on the left here, we've got a new compilation from the last 300 million years. So we get a lot of, of scatter in the dispersion 
actually, which is interesting. Um, but when you bin this, you, you, uh, you average this out, what you get then is this, uh, a value for model G A, and indeed B as well, that is indistinguishable from that which we see from these earlier um, periods, you know, which span billions of years. Um, so that restricts us then to quite a narrow part of this plot, and is suggesting that, you know, with the caveat this is averaged over very long time scales, only when you average over hundreds of millions of years longer, then it seems like the field is indeed um, uh, liable to be, to be axial dipole um, uh, dominated. So this, these kind of set, set, set out the upper and the lower bounds, and this is about the average of, of where we're in, this, uh, we're in this bound. And you, know, you can see many of the dynamo simulations do not fall in this, in this quadrant. So, so it seems to me to be a fairly strong constraint. Um, OK, and now back to the, uh, the, the Macadam model, just again briefly, just to say that the field is, um, uh, yeah, is not always stable. You'll notice that there were some gaps in that record. Um, and I want to talk about two time periods where we can't actually say that the field was axial dipole dominated. And they're quite long, quite significant uh, time periods. You can barely see them as fluctuations around here on these plots. So let's, let's zoom in and, and have a look at those. Uh, so, the first one, I do apologize, I've flipped the time axis uh, on this, this one, but it will be going back on the next slide. Um, but yeah, so we're looking between you know, 200 and 500 million years ago. Um, I've not said much about reversal frequency uh, in this talk so far, but I need to say there are, there are intervals of time when the, the field, uh, so the field today reverses on, on average about four times per million years, but in the past it stopped reversing for tens of millions of years. This gray bar is one such period, the Permo Carboniferous uh, Reverse Supercron. And this is dipole moment. You can see that it, it was high at some parts of this, um, of this supercron. We're interested in this period immediately before that, where reversal frequency, it's unknown. There were definitely reversals, um, but we think it's fundamentally unknowable because the, the field seems to be so non-uniformitarian. This is a conclusion, a lot of work uh, carried out by Louise Hawkins, PhD student at Liverpool, and then Anique van der Boon, uh, who's a postdoc there. And yeah, this, this all um, concluded in this, um, in this review paper, suggesting that, yeah, estimates of reversal frequency, they're likely to be very high, but we, 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 we're really struggling to make them because the, the, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the paleomagnetic observations don't really make much sense, okay? But this was, for an interval of several tens of millions of years, and then it seemed to, uh, seemed to stabilize going into the, into the supercron. And if we go back a bit earlier, um, it gets even worse, okay? So this is um, a well-known time period for geologists, the Ediacaran time just before the Cambrian explosion of life when there were very rapid oscillations in, in geochemical uh, aspects and, and just before the yeah, multicellular life uh, proliferated. Um, so in the Ediacaran, now, thanks to, to, to a lot of recent work, um, a good deal of it done by Dan Falmer, uh, who's now at the University of Florida, who's a PhD student um, at Liverpool, um, really showing that uh, the field was extremely weak in this interval. There's a suggestion that it's, it's, it might be increasing towards the end of it, um, but I guess what I really want to drive home, the point of how weak this is, right? So the maximum value is about 2 times 10 to the 22 amp meters squared for reference, Today's field is nearly eight times 10. So it's less than 25%. And if we look at you know, PADM 2M, which is a model that's, that's been discussed in this, uh, in this meeting several times, um, so it's somewhat smoothed, but still, we look at it, the only time that we're, at, we're getting below two is during, these rever is during the reversals. Okay, so we don't know whether the non-dipole field was independent or scaled with the dipole field uh, for this time interval, um, but the directions are pretty chaotic, so it suggests that it didn't scale entirely with it, okay? And really, you know, it, it could be that we were just in a multipolar state, but then this is for, um, you know, for an interval of uh, 50 million years or so, so very significant for, um, for the magnetosphere as well, I guess. Okay, so I'm at the point now where I can, uh, uh, start to, to um, answer some of these questions. So we've had a, a geodynamo for at least three and a half billion years, um, but it might be much older. Um, and it's, it's held on to this dominant axial dipolar morphology for most of that time. Um, but 
we've had these very uh, strong departures in these, in these uh, two intervals at least. Okay, so just to spend, sorry, spend the last few minutes before lunch uh, to try and talk about the significance of some of this. Uh, so the longevity of the field we can explain through, through core models. So um, I'm drawing out Chris Davies and co-workers paper um, came out earlier this year uh, where there was a bunch of um, thermal evolution models, core thermal evolution models that then uh, made predictions of dipole moment based on QG Mac uh, scalings or convective power um, with the dipole moment. And um, you can see that for, for much of Earth history, it does a pretty good job of, of getting the right numbers for, um, uh, yeah, for Precambrian um, dipole moment, many of these, okay? So you can show that. But then they all predict this very sharp increase. And this is in a core, the signature of inner core nucleation, the sudden introduction of large amounts of, um, uh, of uh, compositional buoyancy and, and latent heat uh, release, giving it, giving it a power boost. So paleomagnetists have, have been fairly obsessed with trying to detect that in the record and I'll kind of give you an update on where we're, where we're at with that. So I guess these are two rival um, uh, uh, claims of the age of inner, in nuclear, uh, of inner core nucleation. So um, one of, between, somewhere in the region 1 to 1 1.5 uh, billion years that we made in, in, in 2015, uh, based on these uh, average long-term averages. And then uh, Bono et al. sometime later said that, no, actually the field is declining through this time, and, and we, have this, um, we have this increase happening at um, around about 5, or sometime after 550 uh, million years. And I guess what we're showing here is we've come together um, to say that actually, you know, that all the new data that's been added, it still does not neither, it neither um, uh, promotes or excludes either one of these models. The jury is still out. And it's, it's you know, cliche to say that we, we need more data, but I hope this figure really shows why we do need more data. So these red points are the, are the new ones which really establish these, uh, these two intervals of very low um, field strength around the time that we might expect the inner core to be nucleating. And you can see there's this huge gap in between and, you know, put two potential tracks of what to see. And they, they both have very strong implications for, for inner core nucleation, you know, perhaps allowing it to be pushed forward as, as, as late as the, um, uh, the onset of the Kaiman, about 320 million years, um, or right back to, uh, to 1.1 billion years or so. Okay. And the last thing I will just say is just something, an idea for what could be promoting the long-term axial dipole stability of the, um, uh, of, the, of the field. So we think it might have something to do with the thermal heterogeneity at the base of the mantle. Um, so we've got a, a cross section here. There are these two um, large low velocity provinces, very clear across seismic um, uh, models. Uh, they're somewhat, they're, they're at the equator, they're, you know, continental in, in size. Um, they're on antipodal positions, one under Africa, one under um, the Pacific, and they're somewhat enigmatic and controversial, but I think everyone agrees that they are hot. They are hotter than the average mantle, okay? And so that is going to be suppressing the heat flowing beneath the, um, uh, flowing out from the, from the core. So um, John Mound and others at Leeds looked into this with some non-magnetic uh, simulations, and um, uh, what they found was that um, the presence of this heterogeneity produced these these are green ISO uh, surfaces showing where the temperature inversion occurred. So thermal stratification, but only regional, only beneath these, these areas with the high heat flow. Um, so I was very keen that, um, to see the results of any magnetic simulations, and I didn't have to, uh, to wait too long. So these are the ones that, that, that uh, Chris Davies and John Mound uh, have run recently. So Ekman 10 to the minus 5, and quite different Rayleigh numbers in these two different simulations. But interestingly, they has similar effects on the, um, you know, you can clearly see, this is centered on the Pacific, you can clearly see the influence of these, um, of these, uh, uh, the low heat flow in producing, uh, suppressing radial flow just below the core mantle boundary. And that has a clear effect on the, on the magnetic field, at least some of the time. Okay, so what you see is, um, yeah, big, uh, so screening effectively of the, the magnetic field. And this, I guess there's two sources of that. First is that these um, stable these stratified layers are not contributing to the dynamo uh, um, action, are not producing 
magnetic field, but also because the conductive layers stable, they're screening out the, um, the, the magnetic field that's generated beneath them. And I guess the, the key point for me for this is that even though you know, the small scale magnetic field and, and flow looks quite different because we've you know, increased the Rayleigh number quite substantially in these cases, you, know, you don't see the small scale stuff at the Earth's surface, right? You see the large scale stuff, and that's all dominated then you know, by these, um, uh, by, by these uh, the, the uh, influence of the thermal heterogeneity. Um, and so that might help then stabilize the large scale field perhaps, and, and you know, we, we do need something to do that. This is a bunch of uh, dynamo simulations um, that, we, that we ran at Leeds, and this is our golden zone, our Earth-like uh, region that I showed earlier. And you see, sometimes we get in there, but often we struggle to, to find ourselves in this Earth-like zone. And even if we do go in there, it's not very stable. You don't have to increase the Rayleigh number very much, and soon um, you're, you're out of it. So it, it's, it's like these simulations are missing something that, that, that stabilizes the actual geodynamo. And um, this thermal heterogeneity, you know, in these models that are run at Leeds, uh, lower Ekman number, you know, that, that does provide a candidate uh, for doing this um, because we see, you know, if, if we run a simulation with homogeneous boundary conditions, that's a blue one, we kind of get on the edge of it at, at the start with by luck, but then as soon as we increase the Rayleigh number, we're way out of there into the multipolar regime. But then doing the same, if you've got this um, uh, thermal heterogeneity um, on there, then it seems to stabilize it regardless, you know, a huge range of Rayleigh numbers, we're still getting these Earth-like uh, values. So you know, this, this screening effect might be, um, uh, might be helping to keep the, the large-scale feature of the field um, uh, stable. Uh, you know, people have argued that these LLVPs are stable over, you know, geological time. I don't think they have to be for this to work. Um, they, uh, I just think you need something large and hot uh, uh, on the equator, basically. But it's not to say they couldn't move around. But yes, that's something for future. So. Um, I'm sorry, I have gone over time a little bit, but so this here is my summary slide, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for the nice talk. Other questions? Oh, everybody wants to go to lunch. It's lunch time. One question, great. Well, so, well thank you, that was very interesting. Uh, without knowing anything at all about the Earth, what does it tell you about the thermal evolution of the Earth? Um, so, uh, well, the fact that if you believe the new estimates for conductivity of iron at, um, in Earth's core, um, then it tells you that you have to have a young inner core um, because to keep the dynamo going over all that time, um, you need to have introduced, you need to have grown uh, the inner core relatively uh, quickly, and that in turn means that you're required then to have a very hot early core, right? Probably hot enough to melt large parts of the lower mantle, right? Which will then have its own effect in terms of insulating the, the core and concentrating radiogenic elements and stuff in the, the base of the mantle. Um, so, yeah, if we, but if we could nail down the inner core age with paleomagnetism, then that would be a massive constraint on the, uh, yeah, on the further details. Okay, Oli? Uh, when you did go back really a long time ago and uh, looking at the well, the well constrained data, there were large gaps of mm. maybe 500 million years or so. Yeah. Uh, a question do I have uh, is it possible that the geodynamo has turned off entirely at some period in Earth's history and then restarted? Well, you know, um, you say? I, I got very told off for, for suggesting that that might have uh, happened. So, you know, it was kind of. Um, yeah, I was put in my place and, and told no, because it would never get started again, so it can't have switched off, you know. That was just, uh, but there's nothing from the data that, that can, um, yeah, that, uh, that, that says that it couldn't have switched off and switched on again. Yes, there are, there are big gaps. Uh, the field is so low in the Ediacaran, I mean, I think I, I might have made this, this point to some of you earlier, that, you know, it's kind of, the, the, those fields, some of the field strengths we're, we're seeing are down below those measured today on the surface of Mars by the InSight lander. Right? So there's no dynamo on Mars. That's purely a crustal magnetization. There is a, you know, there would be a crustal magnetization on Earth as well. 
Um, but yeah, so, it's, so no, it's not impossible that the dynamo is switched off from an observational sense, but I've been told theoretically that it is impossible. So. I mean, I wonder if in any period of time mm. you do have rocks where this supposedly could have recorded a magnetic field, mm. so it would have been a good recorder, mm. according to your criteria, but yeah. uh, you don't find it. Yes, um, no, that's fair enough. I think, <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to encourage the, the, the community very much in that direction of reporting negative results and reporting all the data, no matter how strange they seem. There is a bit of a hangover from the early days, I guess, where people expect the field to be geocentric axial dipole and you know they expect nice stable directions. And if they don't get it, automatically they blame it on the rocks. Right? It's always the rocks' fault, right? Whereas, um, yeah, I guess what we did in the in the Devonian that review paper was say, look, we, you know, we spent a fortune, you know, helicopters, all sorts, field work, you know, sending a neek around the world to the very best rocks of this age, and we just got garbage, right? But we couldn't find any reason that we should have garbage, so we blamed it on the field rather than the rocks. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk, if you could use this to kind of constrain how hot these. Uh, patches are and whether they're electrically conducting or not. I wondered if you could just talk about that. Ooh. Um, yes, that's so. Um, I mean, there's two diff th There's quite a range of temperatures in there already, I guess. Um, so, uh, sorry. So we've got, you know, th this. I'm, I'm afraid I didn't define it there, but Q star is the um, uh, peak to trough uh, difference in the heat flow divided by the mean heat flow. And you see we vary that by, oh, uh, not on this slide, but we do actually vary that by um, a factor of more than two. Um, so if I show this one here, so uh, well, we, we set it to zero, and that does make a difference. 2.3 is already holding steady, five, very similar. Um, I, but I think, yes, there is potential down the line that this sort of thing could be used. But of course, you're gonna, you know, it's tricky because we don't see the signature strongly in the present day field, right? We, I would argue that we do see it in the 100,000, last 100,000 years. Um, I didn't show that, but I, but I have got a slide on that. Um, but yeah, no, it, you know, so uh, I guess we'll be limited by our observational data from archaeomagnetism and things like that. But yeah, I suspect that we could say more than we do at the moment. Okay, I, I have a question. Uh, so y you showed these periods where the field was exceptionally low, mm -hmm. li like around 550 million yeah. years or something like that. W what is your take on it? Was it low because it was multipolar? So that you could deduce from the BTP dispersion, yes. or was it low because yeah. there was no power available or very little heat flux through the concrete yeah, boundary? So it's, it's very different. We can't use the same trick just because the directions are so chaotic that it's not clear what you sort of center on. But, um, but it looks like certainly earlier on in that period, like 580, 600 million years ago, it looked like the field was multipolar as far as I was concerned, yeah. Um. So last question. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, it just seems to me that when you decrease the Ekman number, you will need to increase Q star to stay in that region, I mean, yeah. at least from this plot. How do you expect this to scale when you decrease Ekman number towards Earth-like Earth values? Yeah, so people have mentioned to me that this, this stable reversing dipolar regime should open up, right, as you go down to lower Ekman numbers, and I guess that's the difference between crossing between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 5, that that's helping. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose all I would say is, yeah, we, the, we did run this one simulation, you know, w without with homogeneous boundary conditions at the same... Um, yeah, the, the, the same uh, um, input uh, uh, parameters, and yeah, we got out then this, you know, we got this very multipolar crazy thing. Let's say if you go down, sorry. So if you, w my question was more, do you think like, let's say you go to Ekman to the minus 12, do you think you will accuse star value of five will maintain you into that Earth-like zone, or will you need like unreasonable values for Q star, like let's say 50 or? Uh, I'm just, no, don't, don't yeah, I, values, I, but I don't have do a have great a feel for that. I, I think there are, there are people better, <laughs> better equipped to answer that in this room. Okay. I th 
so just with, the, with this we conclude this session. Let's stand. I thank Andy again. <laughs>